stuff that's inside you, you know, uh, and feelings that we have about perhaps family unit, the idea of sticking with people, of working through issues, of understanding the really positive nature of compromise and potential of that, you know, uh, and how that can be a beautiful thing, not a retreating position, you know. Um, there's something you'd, you'd have to ask Carl, you know, how he felt he would have his perspective on the relationship, you know. Um, I think we challenge each other. We're very different uh, and we've stuck at it. And it's not always being straightforward, but some things I think, you know, you know in your heart are worth investing in perhaps, you know. And um, he still challenges me, you know, and I, I hope I, I do him. And, uh, and then as individuals, it's just something about fire, you know, the, the desire to make things, to express in your medium, whatever that is, paint, sound, music, break it down into subcategories of music. And uh, that, that you can't quench, you know. I, I had a taste of something a long, 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 long time ago. As time goes on and you see perhaps how much people, people enjoy or appreciate what you do, that's a tremendous encouragement to keep going. Being in the moment and having absolutely no choice about that fact. You know, you, you, you're there, whatever your health is, whatever your state of mind is, this is it, you're here. And uh, how that affects us in terms of performance, how it affects the music, the dynamic of the music. Uh, again, you, you could talk with Carl, you know, what, what it means to him as a performer to be engaging with the audience. You know, I tend to have my head down an awful lot. You know, um, I'm challenged by the technology often and poor eyesight. It's live. It's there now. It's, this is the moment that matters. And, you, you know, people spend, producers spend half a lifetime trying to work out how to get that to happen in a studio. And some of them have got tremendous skills and we play all sorts of games in the studio to try and get that feeling of the moment, you know. Um, all you've got to do is walk out on a stage with a bunch of people who paid a lot of money to see you and you've just got to do it. That's absolutely right. And, 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 and in, in a way, your description of old style dub technique was kind of perfect because it's not just about effects and echoes. It's about deconstruction and construction and reconstruction and rearrangement. And that to me was always the best kind of dub, you know, so, so excited me back in my 20s, you know. The first time I saw Anya sound and saw the things that they were doing and reggae I loved. And it seemed to me that it had something very much to do with craft work and I don't know why, but I don't, I don't know. I'd, I made a leap in my head and went, this is the same. <laughs> so uh, I'd stretch in some idea there. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, absolutely right. It is, it's, a, it's, a, it's an instrument, you know. It's absolutely an instrument right at the heart of the stage. In different ways, different games at different times, you know. 35 years a long time, there was no digital audio recording when, or at least not that we could afford um, when I first started. Um, the advantages of software, the ability to control, to, to fine tune, to tweak, to look at an arrangement and do one thing in one moment and be able to repeat it and print it. That's all fantastic stuff. There is also a balance of this energy where you're forced into the moment with equipment. And for me, the, the extraordinary thing about a mixing desk, when you bring a bunch of stuff up and you link that to effects, it's just old school dub style. And the way you respond either to the tone or the balance or the arrangement, you know, uh, it doesn't always work. It's like an analog synthesizer. You, you can't hit a preset and it just sounds great every time. But if you're prepared to fail occasionally or often, then when it does succeed, it's something uh, that's almost unrepeatable. I, I, I've, I've often ended up doing live mix and then spending two weeks trying to print the programmed version of it 
sometimes with some success, you know. Uh, recreate in Dubno Bass, which was, which I mixed very much live on an old console a long time, 20 years ago. <laughs> I think you've got choices, you know. We've changed at different points in our career to a different orientation, you know, a different way of presenting energy. Um, recently with Dub No Bass, when we wanted for the first time to take that album out again, this was just last year at the Festival Hall was the first one, and we're about to do the last couple now. It, it was actually very important. I felt that people knew that album so well and had taken it to their hearts to such an extent that it was important that we rendered something that was as close to the guidelines, the sort of limits of what, what it sounded like, the way the grooves felt, something about what the original was. And so the, the approach was much more intense in the preparation and, and it was a tricky record to recreate as well, to break down parts that were never saved properly, that were on samplers that had blown up and burnt out and bits of tape machine and this kind of thing. And so it could never be an exact copy because as I said, those were, those were live in the moment for me, things that happened and mixes. Uh, but to try and get close to that was a big issue. And then for Carl and I to uh, really try and nail, you know, and, 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 and think, repeat, repeat, do it the same, do it the same. For Carl to find the person that he was in the performance, you know, and try and bring that, not the person he'd been on stage for 20 years. And for me to restrain myself, you know, in terms of how to deconstruct and reconstruct. Because, I, I don't know, it'd be a bit like going to see James Brown and, and, and he does, Papa's got a brand new bag on a acoustic guitar. It's not really what I want, you know, you know, so, something I would have, would have wanted, God bless him. Um, so, uh, so this recently, it's been much more orientated to that and about this trying to create this extraordinary space again, coming out of a phase where perhaps it was much more about reinterpretation and, uh, and the need to find energy and excitement each night. And uh, we learned in the 80s that when things go wrong and uh, mistakes are made, that something happens and the audience and you really start to click. And so that's a different kind of thing to a, a, a repetition or a repeat or trying to contain something. That's much more about abandon. And that can be extraordinary when, when you can do that and it's not working, it's not working, it's working. And this fire, this energy starts to happen and you can see it and feel it with people and you feel it yourself. And it fuels more of the same, you know? And then you lose it, and then you get it back again. So there's, there's many different ways, you know, to approach, I think, performing electronic music live, you know? And, and, we, and we're uh, experimenting still with different ways. And, and this is very new for us, the SSL. So, you know, I, I feel it's just, it's taken me probably about seven or eight years to make any fundamental change to our live setup. And, uh, and, and here is this thing which is at the heart of it now. And the potential of it is as important to me as what we're actually doing right now. It's absolutely crucial, you know, for, for me, from, from a really young age, sound, I, my, my mum was a piano teacher and I, I was taught piano from a very early age, but the sound of records, the sound of film and the various different ways that music sounds when it's replayed over different pieces of equipment, loudspeakers or in a performance or in a different hall, this is stuff that fires me up. And, uh, and in life, I, I hear stuff that is perhaps we'd call non-musical. And, and I can't remember a time when I didn't feel like this, you know. Uh, uh, and, and it makes me think and feel and think, how does that translate? Why do I recognize that? Why does that make me feel good? Or why does that annoy me? You know, what aspect of that is interesting in, term, in, in terms of creativity? What's its equivalent? You know, it's a kind of weird, screwed up engineer sonic p 
painting thing. I don't know what I don't know what what it is, but um, I I can't help myself. You know, um, I I know that something that is uh, is important. And over the years, uh, you have to tame obsession when it goes too far. Is you have to be careful that the pursuit of a particular thing doesn't leave everything else in its wake. Um, and I think I've made plenty of mistakes in my life like that, where uh, with sound. Um, but you just pick yourself up and go, okay, uh, I'll have a go again and see if I can get it better this time, you know? It's been fantastic. You know, uh, we've actually only been using this now for maybe five months. Uh, and I've spent nowhere near the amount of time that I deep in my heart wish that I could because I enjoy it. But there are other things to do as well as spend time uh, with the L500. I think I said earlier, you know, the, the, the mixing desk is an, a very important instrument to me and is at the heart of what Underworld can and can't do on stage. And the preparation of the technology for a performance has always been quite an elaborate thing, you know, for me and hugely time consuming. You know, you spend six months a year preparing for shows uh, and then you're just getting on and doing it, you know. I, st I started out uh, with, with a bit of Googling, looking around, seeing what was around and about. I, I, I counseled friends, you know, expert and otherwise, people who had experience with consoles. It was tricky because I knew I was looking for a console that was going to sit in a performance aspect on stage as opposed to purely front of house. Um, tried to keep that in mind. Uh, had some great advice and feedback off John Newsham, the people that I worked with. Um, and it was curious, you know, something started to gel very quickly. There was, in the, in the middle of it all, there was this name SSL, a company that's been at uh, the heart of, you know, excellence in recorded music and technology for an awful long time. And I've never, never been able to afford to have one in the studio, but I've used them plenty of times going to various different places. Um, the idea that there's a British company whose ethos at the center was something crucial to me, which is what I put into it. I wanted at least, the very least, it's got to come out sounding as good and with a bit of luck better and so i think uh, you know it, it very quickly there became you know kind of no choice everything about it started to slot into place the capabilities of it as i say the idea of ssl that the britishness of the company and their history was important to me because it made me feel confident about something that i knew would take me some time to explore there was uh, a, a lot of other stuff some detail that perhaps isn't relevant to other people, the footprint of the console, the fact that it was so self-contained, the fact that data-wise it looked like it had serious intent. It, it, it was curious, all of a sudden there was 20 consoles to look at and I don't know what and I know nothing and it became very quickly actually I think there's only one um, and then I went to uh, SSL, spoke with Mike, Mike Banks uh, uh, met up with and had a demo and it started to explore the console uh, and then a, a, a fantastic guy Andy Huffer uh, came and, 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 and just brought a lot of excitement and warmth along with it and I think we actually we got the console real fast probably not as rigorous as some people think you perhaps should be but I felt that I, I knew in my heart you know that it was all going to work out so there was real joy then when we started to use it and everything we plugged in was just, I felt it just sounded better, you know, which was more than I'd hoped for, really. It's also, as I say, we have only had about five months with this and it's the uh, potential of this thing as an instrument, as a hub on stage. You know, what it allows us to be able to choose to plug in, to root and matrix in a way that, in a, I mean, I, I, I'm a catalog lover of analog, but you, the patch bays and the cables and 
this stuff that you have to air freight around the world um, becomes less and less workable. This started to become really exciting. And so it was just then about spending some time and finding a way into um, an interface that is not like a classic dub interface. Um, you, you, you can't just reach for one of a duplicate of sets of stuff with 25 knobs on each channel. And we've, of course, had decades of experience with dealing in that way. So it's been an interesting learning curve. And what I'd hope would happen is, is that in the programming of it to uh, become more of an instrument, there are new ways of working with dub and with arrangement that are possible with the console that, that are very difficult with an analog console. And, and for us, for live, when you don't have an hour to just get that together and recall that and do that like that and set that up, you literally got seconds and everything has to happen so fast. Very different from front of house. This is just a, an extraordinary thing, you know, and, and, and extraordinary for what I know we're going to do with it over the next couple of years as well. You know. it's, we've just started. Okay. At the moment, all of the above, the, the, the screen, so my, my, I, I think it's different for everybody. I think what's wonderful is, is that one has the choice to be able to orientate in that, you know, in whatever way pleases you. I use a little of both, largely use the screen. Um, uh, I'm quite familiar with iPad-esque, you know, and I, I've always had a craving for touchscreen on stage in all sorts of areas. So um, I, I find that uh, quite straightforward. It's, uh, the console is clear and bright and in my face, uh, which when you're drowning in smoke and lights, and energy, dim light, sunlight, you know, this is all rather, it's really important. If you can't see, then you can't work. Yeah, I'd say all that. I'd say, I'd say, you know, aspects. Sometimes it's really nice to turn to a rotary encoder when you're working with a compressor or EQ or a, an effect. Uh, other times it's absolutely beautiful to tap a button and draw, pinch, extend. You know, these are quite nice words to use really when you're talking about EQ I find it kind of interesting you know it's, it's not all about that left and right and clockwise and anti-clockwise you know it's, it's curious you know yeah I get flummoxed sometimes you know but I think that's what you do when you're learning software when you're really starting to get inside something you know yeah I could do this so fast yesterday yeah yeah just chill out give it let's give it a second oh oh actually that's quite straightforward you know? SSL are very particular about when they update software and uh, Mike had spoken to me and said look you know we don't do this lightly and that's very appreciated you know you, you, I, we can't be beta testing stuff when we're on stage this is not on you know so any rigor in making sure that things are what they are is very appreciated anyway this software update and I've just seen a PDF I haven't had a chance to play with it it just absolutely cracked me up it's not like a software update like we understand a software update it's like you, you can't be serious. This is actually taking the console to a whole another level again, you know, it is, and again, it's, you know, how can I be unhappy, you know, working, being supported by a company that behaves like that? You know, when you're uh, fortunate to be a professional and earn money from what you do traveling around the world, the relationship that you have with the people who make the equipment you own and the support that you get is crucial it, it, it can it can actually make a decision of whether you use that equipment or not you know sonic quality whatever if you can't work with the people who make it then you've probably got a problem it's going to bite you and it's going to bite you when you're in buenos aires or you know or in toronto or somewhere you know and uh, where you oh dear you know? and as i say so far Everything about working with them has been, you know, genuinely. I know I sound like a massive SSL salesman. I, I can't help it. I would say likely, yeah, very likely. Right now, <laughs> you know, it's all just to do with timeline and work and what we've got. We're going live 
again with a new season in about a week and a half. And so our priorities are different. Yeah, no, I, I, I would say very likely. In, in fact, I'm itching to get stuff done and then get the console off the road, out of our rehearsal studio and get it into my home studio, which is where I feel really comfortable and start to play and explore. But I've just got to be patient, you know? It's been lovely to talk to you, actually, yeah. And I, I, I think, like I said, you know, it's, uh, it's lovely to be able to talk about something that, you know, as I say, it's been seven or eight years where I just felt all I was doing was tweaking our live equipment. And then to finally work with this and realize that it was what I'd hoped it could be and what it might be is uh, very exciting for me. You know? The future looks bright. <laughs> Thank you, SSL. For me, this, one of the things it's, it's introduced is its consistency. And as was shown on the, on the recent Dubno Bass Tour, Rick had put in so much work into this as an instrument that uh, his, his vibe, his point of view, uh, was embedded in the, in the instrument so that when, unfortunately, he became ill and was unable to be on the tour, it was like he was still on stage with me and that made me feel very confident so that when uh, Darren Price was operating as, as instructed, it was as close to working with Rick as I, as, as I could imagine. And that does a lot for me. It, you, can, you can imagine if, if there's a desk and you can't recall and it's, it's what, what's it going to be like tonight? I'm thinking this guy really better know his stuff. <laughs> Because I'm, I need it. I need the stuff to be consistent, and uh, and so that that was that was a big thing for me. I remember seeing, remember seeing Larry Adler play at. Uh, this is an old story I often tell. Larry Adler play at the uh, Royal Festival Hall, and he did an amazing concert with an accompanying pianist. And then he said, "I'm going to do something now." This he brought out this piano that was had been programmed by Gershwin, who was no longer with us. And they performed together, and it was a really emotional experience because it was all of Gershwin's moves were on this piano, and it was a fantastic concert. And that, that was the highlight for me, and has left a huge impression. So, it, in a lot of ways, it was like that for me, going out and doing those first dates of the tour, kind of without Rick, but he was here, and that that means a lot, you know. Do I like how it sounds? I do like how it sounds, yeah. yeah I, wasn't I wasn't sure at first because change is always a bit freaky. You get used to something and someone goes, actually, it's better. And you go, actually, I'm not sure it is. <laughs> I think that's your point of view. But as you listen to it, if you flip back to where, where we were, you go, oh, okay, yeah, great. I'm very happy. Thank you very much. We've, we've made a leap and we don't want to go back. I also like the way it looks. No, but it's, but it's true. You know what, we use cameras a lot on stage. And you can imagine, we're not a traditional a group. I was, I was going to say we're not a traditional group. Groups have become, we have become a bit of a blueprint for a lot of bands that work, work in a, in a similar-ish, apparently similar-ish way. Um, so there's not a lot going on. You haven't got a drummer and, and horn section and, and orchestra. There's not lots, wow, check it all out. So it, when you've got loads of cameras all over the place, the cameras would often like, okay, let's look at Rick's hands, but it's not much happening on the desk really, is there? But whenever we, we did on the tour, whenever we played places that had balconies around, you just see people, wow, it's like Disneyland. And that's, you know, that's really worth something. That's really worth a lot when you haven't got a drummer and a horn section and the girls kind of, in the, you know, giving it all that lot. It's really worth a lot, so. Nice light show. <laughs> it's all theatre, yeah. yeah.